So I'm going to dive into that hard question about how do we get to a complete library of everything. Um, not just the public domain, but the 20th century materials, which are sort of in kind of limbo land, and then also the newest um, books. The, the big thing that's really confronting us in libraries, I'd say, is really do we buy or do we rent? Is that, there's a question that, it, are e-books really fundamentally different from books? Um, and as digitization has gone through the library field, we've built up basically these large mainframe companies to go and uh, uh, bring together and license materials out, whether it's LexisNexis and, and Westlaw was one of the first in the whole law area. Um, the journal publishing uh, area ended up in just a couple companies' hands and then JSTOR as a nonprofit that is also still a, a, um, a centralized uh, source. Um, so is this the, the future where basically things are going to be massively centralized or are we going to have something more analogous to what we did in the print age um, in, this, uh, in this digital age? There are some real advantages to going with a uh, more distributed buy versus rent uh, environment. And I'm going to suggest how uh, this is being done by now a thousand libraries that the Internet Archive is working with. What do we want? At the end of the day, what we want is lots of winners. We want lots of publishers, lots of booksellers, looks, lots of booksellers, many, many libraries, including really weird, quirky libraries that you wouldn't necessarily go and have. Oh, I, I uh, okay. I guess quirky isn't something you're supposed to say before somebody. So uh, tomorrow there's a smut sale um, from the sexandculture.org library. Um, so there are libraries that have collections that are non-overlapping with your library. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and we want this uh, going, uh, going forward. Actually, I, I'm really looking forward to this book. Uh, so um, it, and we want lot, uh, many authors that actually can get paid, uh, and we want everyone a reader. That's what we want. Um, and a lot of, I, I use this as my litmus test against things like the Google Books uh, settlement or whatever to go and figure out, are, are we getting there or are we going to end up with central points of control? What we want uh, also, I would suggest, is a 10 million book library. That's sort of a Yale, a Princeton, or a Boston public library. A world class library is 10 million books. So we sort of take that as um, you know, a, a goal, a nice big round number. A couple million of those are public domain, seven million out of print, and one million in print, roughly, um, in terms of how it, how it all breaks down. And I'd say we're about 20% of the way there. We basically have the public domain online, um, which is actually pretty neat. A lot of people have worked very, very hard across a lot of libraries to go and put the public domain up with no restrictions and make it available out on the internet. So I'd like to just say thank you to everybody that's put two million books online. Now we have some other things to do. There's the out of print and the imprint world. Um, what I'm going to suggest, and I'm going to sort of hit it from a few different ways, is that we buy all the e-books we can outright. Buy it as, as, in the sense that we used to buy physical books. Buy, hold, lend out, so that if you buy five copies, you can have five uh, e-books circulating at any particular time. We can preserve them, we can reorganize them, we can reformat them to sort of make sure that they're, they're staying in people's hands after the publishers have finished their commercial phase of it. Um, digitize older books into e-book formats. Lend e-books. I know it sort of sounds odd to lend e-books because it is sort of something that is, is shortchanging the, what the, the digital promise was. Is that you can have infinite numbers of copies. Well, you can, but there's some problems to that. And I'm not sure we can quite get to that step yet, um, and maybe never will. So lend, buying and lending is a way we can go. And distribute, not through apps and not through hard, uh, dedicated hardware devices, but through open systems like browsers. So that we, have, uh, we can invest in these things to get them to a maximum number of people um, in open uh, ways. So basically, uh, we want to serve um, e-books in many ways, somewhat the same way that we did physical books. But in many ways, it's actually easier. It's sort of like our catalogs. A book is about a megabyte or 10 megabytes if it's a scanned, um, scanned PDF. Um, I actually have in my hand, actually, uh, I have in my hand 150,000 scanned books. There's 150,000. And it costs about 200 bucks. And so in a shopping cart at Best Buy, you could go and buy the seven hard drives that it would take to go and do and have a million books. 
So libraries that can run a catalog can run an ebook system that does lending. Um, so that's pretty neat. So I, that was a real sort of eye opener. I kind of look at this like, wow, we don't really need mainframe style uh, organizations um, to be able to be um, uh, book server systems. Okay. So what I'm saying, buying and lending and scanning and lending of ebooks. So what does this look like? Well, you end up with nice books um, that are on screens. They're starting to be on, on cool devices um, and even cooler devices and lots and lots of devices. So the idea of going in and thinking that you're done once by going and scanning once is <laughs> it's never done. You have to reformat for all of these different things, including the thing on the lower right, which is a talking thing for the uh, blind and dyslexic. It talks a little bit like this. But we now have more books for the blind and dyslexic um, than they've ever had by about a factor of 10, just because we've gone and reformatted all of the books that were done in the open um, into, this, uh, into that format uh, and locked it up using the Library of Congress keys so that we could do all the way thing, things through Harry Potter. Um, how do you get there? Scanning centers, please visit the one next door. Um, and there are now these things all over the world. Um, we're scanning things like <laughs> Balinese palm leaves. Um, I think the, the first people that will have their whole language online, everything published in their language, are going to be the Balinese. I think it's kind of cool. No, it's not the English. It's not the, it's not the, uh, the Icelandic. Nope, nope, nope. Balinese. Uh, anyway, then there's these beautiful uh, things. So scanning is happening at scale. Um, we scan about 1,000 books a day, um, books of older books as well as newer books. Um, it costs about 10 cents a page to, to digitize, so a 300-page book is about $30 a book. That's about what it costs to either buy a book for a library, or it's about as much as it costs to build a physical library to store a book. So if you're going to spend that kind of money, might as well just uh, digitize it. And after you're done digitizing, please don't throw them away. Um, and you know, there's sort of the butchering of books, which I just find really, uh, um, So we, we do non-destructive, and we, we really want to hold on to these things long term. So we're, we've gotten better at doing long-term storage, or very dense storage, so that you don't have to deaccession. De if you're going to deaccession, please deaccession to us, and we'll, and we'll put it away if we, haven't, if we don't have any copies of it. And we're uh, now up to around 450,000 books, and we'd like to get to 10 million on the order of 10 million physical books. Um, and this will be just another type of repository for uh, long-term books. OK, so what are we talking about now? We've got now 3 million books by working with, a, I think these books have come from about six or 700 libraries um, through funding from lots of different folks. Uh, we have about 350,000 modern books. These are sort of post-1923 books that are available to the blind and dyslexic. That really got kicked off with stimulus money and some foundation fund funds. And we have 200,000 in a modern lending library. I'm going to spend most of that the time on sort of how does that work. So then there's uh, uh, 8 million books, I'd say, to go. So openlibrary.org is a website uh, done by the Internet Archive uh, with, with gracious funding from California State and a bunch of other places. Um, and we get about 200,000 uh, users a, d a day. And it's open and editable. It's, the idea is one web page for every book ever published. It's kind of an open catalog, a Wikipedia of books, if you will. Um, and through this, we have a lending system that you can do. Um, there are now 1,000 libraries that are part of our e-lending system, uh, where uh, libraries have signed up to contribute in recent books to be digitized and lent under their names. So the idea of this is a group effort to go and take contributions from a lot of libraries all walking together saying, we can lend books. So we now have 1,000 libraries participating. Let's take the Boston Public Library. So if you're in the Boston Public Library and go to, um, uh, to Open Library, I'm going to try doing a live demo. Should I, should I support death? Sure. Yeah? All right. OK. All right. OK. None of this canned stuff. All right. Um, <laughs> if you go to openlibrary.org, um, and if you're in California, because actually all of the state of California is, is part of this pro program because the state librarian signed up and contributed uh, recent books to be added, there are 200,000 books that are 200,000 books that are available um, to be uh, borrowed. These are these are modern recent uh, books. Um, I've 
couple of my favorites. Um, if you wanted to go for HTML5 for web designers, um, here's this. Oh no. Huh? So much for live to see. Uh, 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 you missed all of this. Oh, well, there was a great demo you missed. <laughs> so much for live, right? Okay. How's that? There you go. Yes. Any better? Okay. All right. So I, I, um, we want HTML5 uh, for web designers. This is a book that we've bought, um, and, but it's already checked out by somebody else. So I can put it on my list to go and say, you know, remind myself to go back. It doesn't remind you yet, but you know, features all coming. Um, but the idea is you can borrow this book, but this, is, this book is checked out. Why is, what does that mean to be checked out? Well, somebody else has it and they haven't returned it or two weeks haven't gone by. If two weeks happen, then it kind of evaporates from their point of view uh, and they, they don't have it anymore. Um, so let's go for an even less popular book, um, the Our Mayflower Ancestors and Their Descendants. Well, thanks to uh, the, Boston, um, the Boston Public Library, which you can see here, um, it's that they took this from their shelves, digitized it, it's a book from 1994, added it to this collection and took the, the physical book and sort of took it out of circulation. So now the access version is the one that's available on the net. Um, and I can go and say, okay, I want to borrow this book. Uh, you can borrow a PDF using this sort of overdrive technology, the Adobe Digital Editions. Uh, it's sort of a crypto thing that makes it so you can read it on a plane but it's kind of hard to use. Um, and also, uh, we've also imitated what the publishers use for their in-print works with the Google eBook Store when they put uh, in-print books on the web. Uh, we then found that the publishers were now up for having books on the web, um, not just in an encrypto package. Um, and so we emulated that and we said, we want to borrow it. And presto, we've now borrowed this book. Hooray! Okay. So, uh, and it says, you know, it's been digitized um, with funding from the Boston Public Library. And you can uh, move through this book and, and read it and uh, see it in different ways um, and the like. So this is, uh, we've just borrowed this book um, and I'm going to dutifully return it. Um, so then somebody else can go and check this out. I actually am kind of psyched because my grandfather's book, um, the pop Pos <clears throat> the Power of Positive Living, a self-help book from the 1950s, um, really important to me and my kids, um, was checked out by somebody else. So I'm kind of psyched about that. So I was going to demonstrate <laughs> it on this. But, uh, um, so, so the idea here is uh, there's 200,000 books um, that are being uh, lent out. Uh, and it's all working. So let me go back to... Uh, the library lending model. So who's in? Who's, who's working on this? So the State Librarians Association, this is the state librarians of, of the 51 states in the United States, have signed an MOU with the Internet Archive endorsing this, and five of the states have gone and contributed books to the Internet Archive to be scanned and lent out under their name, and we've turned on their whole state. So then, they, then those are uh, those thousand libraries, and also there's libraries in six uh, countries that have gone and signed up. So either the universities, like the University of Toronto, University of Alberta, um, ones in Europe and Asia, have signed up such that um, they're part of this pool, and we're showing that it's working. This has been going on for now two years. How to sign up? Well, you write to Robert at archive.org. Uh, you contribute at least one modern book. Um, all the public domain books that you have, free them. Um, so the idea is um, at least let's not go backwards and lock up the public domain. Most people don't have that many public domain scan books, but it's sort of one of the steps towards doing this. Uh, can say what your IP addresses are or the geographic region and contact info. There's no you know, signatures or anything. And 200,000 books then are turned on for all of those users. And so this is a system that's working and we're doing basically for the 20th century. We're buying books and lending them and we're scanning 20th century books and lending them. And we're now up to 200,000. And I think that's uh, going along pretty well. The next step, the next million books. So we're now at sort of 200,000. I'd say what our, our real challenge is, is to do the next million books. 
I would suggest we do it slightly differently. Instead of waiting for the next uh, recession and, and uh, uh, so the next stimulus program comes around so we can go and do a lot of scanning, let's go and pool money from a bunch of libraries to go and select and build the collection and get the ending digital files and pass the files back out to the contributing libraries. So if we had a set of libraries that came together to build this collection, then we end up with uh, these digital files being held in these different libraries collections to be used for as much as currently is allowed. So the blind and dyslexic certainly, and different people will have different ideas as how far can we go with these digital files. We're all law abiding, but, the, but exactly what law abiding means in a gray zone is sometimes there's some experiments done. And the idea of having a centralized point of control so that one person goes and says what it is that uh, should be done is just too fragile a system. So what we really want is many, many libraries. So uh, if that were to happen with that next million books, then of course you know what the next answer would be. Let's do another million books. Um, and I'd say by the time we get to ten, 10 million books, then we've got kind of a good collection of purchased books, scanned um, 20th century materials, and the public domain done. So the carved, carved over the door of the Carnegie Library in Pittsburgh, one of my favorite phrases, free to the people. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm sure this will happen. My library has some. Brewster has some of our library books. We love it. We got, it's a nice way to get rid of the stuff you don't want anymore and not do something bad with it. Um, Siri is the co-chair of the ALA committee, working committee on digital, ALA digital content. That committee came out of a committee called EQUAC, a lovely name, which was the Equal Access to Electronic Resources that was a presidential task force for ALA last year. That's more than you wanted to know or needed to know. Um, she's going to tell us what ALA has been doing this year on the ebook front and where they are going as they move on to this next year. So first I have to tell you why I agreed to co-chair this committee. <laughs> because anyone who knows me was really surprised and it's perfect that I'm making this confession in the church. <laughs> I'm doing it as complete penance for the fact that when I was at the Cleveland Public Library and I was the deputy director, I signed the first public library contract with Overdrive using the model that they currently <laughs> provide to libraries, so I'm co-chairing this committee as penance. But I want to tell you that when, you we, <laughs> when we signed that contract about 12 years ago, nobody cared. Customers didn't care, publishers didn't care, and quite frankly, the library community didn't care. Because there was not the matching consumer technology that has made it so popular, nobody could have foreseen the impact of the Kindle and, quite frankly, mobile technologies and what a difference that would make. So um, I'm working hard on this committee. Uh, <laughs> the committee is formed around a number of different issues, but I can tell you that the number one issue is ebooks in the big six publishers. And as a public library director of a large public library, even though I'm very excited about the opportunity to have access to all kinds of digital content and to a lot of things I heard today. Those, the big six and the fact that we do not have access for our libraries and in turn access for consumers, that people are being denied the opportunity. Um, as one of my colleagues said here today, and I, hopefully that will come out in the questions, um, is really a, a big concern for the American Library Association. So um, American Library Association President Molly Raphael, um, Keith Michael Fields, who's the executive director of ALA, and Maureen Sullivan, who's the incoming president of ALA, have been very active in meeting with big six publishers, and they've had um, a very open dialogue and communication. One of the things that has become increasingly clear is that the publishers do not understand the library market even though they've been selling to us in a variety of formats through our entire history, and that libraries don't really understand the publishing market that well. And that there are many um, pressures right now 
that are really, um, you know, uh, what publishers are concerned about, obviously pressure from Amazon and pressure from Apple as to what publishing will be in the future. And I think that's one of the big questions. Um, obviously, uh, you, you're reading increasingly and every day about other models that are coming to light. Um, the most recent is the partnership between the Kansas State Library and Bilberry. But again, um, these opportunities are not providing access to the new content from the big six publishers. So um, at, a at the recent ALA Midwinter, there was also a lot of conversation with distributors or aggregators, as they're often called, like Overdrive, Baker and Taylor, Ingram, and 3M. And um, we see that more and more of the distributors that have been selling to public libraries have been aggre aggregating content from publishers will be getting into this business. It doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to open the door with publishers, um, but it will probably bring more pressure on the publishers as well as increasing access to data. Overdrive is in a kind of a, a beta test of some data release with five public libraries, I believe, right now. Uh, Baker and Taylor is also looking at a way to provide more data, which should help in the future. I think one of the most recent um, tactics that ALA is going to uh, begin uh, rallying around is uh, relationships with authors. We feel that there is a historic and a traditional relationship with libraries and that authors do not understand what is going on in the ebook market. Um, we are going to be working with a number of different author or organizations like the Penn Association, which has stood behind free access and free speech throughout its entire history. So we're hoping that there'll be some kind of leveraging of ALA initiatives around authors in the near future. And then, of course, we're very interested in what is happening here and what is happening with the Digital Public Library of America and how that can be leveraged in the future. Um, I think at this point, I'll let um, my favorite <laughs> West Coast director speak. <laughs> and, um, uh, hopefully you'll have provocative questions for yeah, us. We're hoping this will be a very interactive session and that you all will contribute and ask questions and tell us what you think about these issues because they're, they're on the surface right now. They may not last forever, hopefully, and we really would like to hear some conversation from the group. Okay, Louise. Thank you. Well, this is really kind of pushing the envelope for me because it, it forced me to really uh, sort of dig into and delve into not only our strategy at San Francisco Public in terms of collection management and collection development, um, but also what the landscape is on sort of a macro level. But I always use the opportunity when I'm talking about collection development and library strategies to talk about how important it is right now to have every library um, initiate or have a digital initiative strategy. Everything begins with that. So what I'm referring to, and, and you'll understand the connection that I'll make, is that we need to understand how um, collection management, for whether it's ebooks or, or uh, the archival environment uh, of our wonderful collections, how that plays in in terms of prioritization within your library. It also talks about how it ties into your overall strategic priorities within your organization? And then how do you build capacity? How do you determine who does what within your organization to make sure that you have impact in the, the users and the community you're serving? Uh, and then we, we seek partnerships, because at the end of the day, it's all about leveraging the limited resources that we have in terms of not only purchasing power, uh, but the themes that we've heard throughout the afternoon and this morning was all about what do we do to partner and how do we expand our, our resources. So how does that tie into ebooks? Well, there's a disconnect from my standpoint in terms of what's happening with the amazing explosion in not only e-readers, but e-reader devices. Uh, some of you may have read the article that talked, uh, I think it was Pew, it was a Pew study that talked about within three months, the number of e-readers uh, um, devices and the American, the percentage of Americans that had it went from 13% to 29% in about three months. Think about that, that is amazing. So the disconnect here is that we have 
the growing demand and awareness of this market, uh, but the disconnect between availability and access. And those are two really serious considerations, uh, certainly for the public library arena. Uh, so in terms of what's happening just in our corner of the world, uh, we are putting more and more resources into the collection development strategy. Um, we used to spend maybe 2% of our entire materials budget. Uh, next year, we're looking at 8%, which is significant uh, to keep up with uh, the growing demand. There's a, a public libraries article that talks about other libraries. It's going to grow from about 2% of your entire materials budget to about 4%. Doesn't seem like a lot. But the issue is that how do we do that within the framework that we have of our, of our limited resources? And how do we meet that demand uh, with the growing public? The other disconnect is that um, while most Americans right now look at uh, purchasing of e-materials, e-books, uh, e there's a digital divide issue. Uh, what happens to the, the, the vast uh, numbers of folks that turn to the public library, in fact, to access this digital commercial uh, materials if it's not available? And, and I really commend the fact that you know, there, there's a, a push to make sure that publishers do see the public library as um, a player in access of this critical content, because if not, we're going to have the sort of the commercial side literally dictate information policy. And that's not a good thing. That's not uh, democratic. And, and I use those concepts, actually, and, and I give credit to uh, two individuals that are in the audience. Um, about several, several months ago, actually in March, uh, the Los Angeles Public Library, under the then leadership of Martin Gomez, hosted the National Public Library of America dialogue that was, again, a lot of the players that are in the DPLA were involved in that conversation. And while it was a very, very good conversation during the course of two days to talk about uh, the archival connections and how we're gonna bridge all the meta metadata, what wasn't talked about a lot was this whole entire commercialization, uh, the in copyright commercial um, uh, uh, material that should be available. So there is a, a white paper that's out there that uh, I think fully explains that issue. And so with their permission, uh, and it's Martin Gomez and Pat Lasinski that are, if you could raise your hands, you can have conversations during the break with these individuals because uh, on the back row and, and, and back here. Um, because I really do think that it raised the issue of how important this uh, public policy discussion is uh, in terms of those conversations with publishers uh, to make sure that we're not denied access in, in that entire area. The message board for um, the conversation about this, uh, I'm going to call that out, so you might want to write this down, is ndpl.lapl.org. So um, use that to your advantage, and I think the, the conversation is just beginning. So the other piece of the disconnect is the facility of use. And, and by that, I mean the interface that, that our users uh, need. They, they go to the Amazons uh, because what we provide doesn't work. I struggle, believe me, and, I, and I'm surrounded by IT folks uh, on how to get that e-reader on my iPad. Um, it, whether it's generational or whether it's not as intuitive, the issue is that there's a huge literal disconnect in terms of that facility of use. So there's another issue there that we have the growing demand, uh, the market's out there, but so many folks are not um, able to, to use that, uh, that facility. Our librarians, our library staff are now kind of the, the pioneers in having all these, uh, call them what you will, petting zoos in terms of having the public come to us to train them on how to use the, the various uh, uh, tools that are out there. Um, but it is a serious concern and in many ways a kind of a new frontier for the public library arena. So how does it all tie into uh, DPLA? I think we've heard very clearly that the initial focus this year will be on the, the notion of the public domain materials, uh, but that DPLA could play a role in the future in terms of those conversations with publishers. Uh, raising that, um, that issue of the public policy that uh, I alluded to, uh, and certainly uh, being the convener of how important this uh, in copyright 
uh, those collections are. We heard earlier this morning, and it resonated with me, the whole resource sharing value that we can bring. And, and I think there's a lot of good work that's beginning uh, out there. Certainly the role of consortia uh, is important in how they leverage the dollars to uh, purchase uh, e-books uh, and e-media. That collaboration value is going to be very, very important uh, as we push this envelope. Uh, just in talking to uh, colleagues, uh, Dwight in uh, Georgetown County, a small rural area, um, uh, was able to leverage dollars by working with a consortia to purchase a preloaded um, uh, Kindles so that the public can check them out. They're ahead of us in that game in San Francisco. We're not doing that yet. Uh, the conversations and what Khalifa is doing, which is a huge consortia in Northern California, uh, to do what uh, Douglas County is doing in terms of being able to, uh, again, buy digital content uh, and check it out directly, I think is um, to be piloted more and more. Uh, I'm a willing player in that, and I encourage all of us to work to leverage dollars so that we can have more purchasing power in the marketplace. Um, so basically, I think I'll, I'll just leave it at that, but, but say that there aren't certainly clear answers now, but it does raise public policy issues uh, and access issues that I think we need to be in the forefront of so, Sari solving. wants to say something, and then I'm going to open this up to anybody who wants to ask Brewster questions about the lending program, the million next, next million books. Um, Pat and Martina, if you want to say something, I think people might like to hear as a group here something about the white paper and anything else you want to say on this topic. Um, this is your chance. So I, I just wanted to refer back to the Pew study that was just released because as we look at that and we understand it will feed the digital divide, it is also going to feed a literacy divide based on economics because people who are reading with e-readers are once again reading more. And if our you know, poorest, less literate population does not have access to e-content and to perhaps I, and, and we know from experience at Cuyahoga County Public Library that if we create a way to download directly to a smartphone that we are able to reach people who are in the lowest economic groups because they do have smartphones. And so, again, we have to look at that piece of the literacy divide that will become more and more significant. I want to mention that there will be a program at ALA on Sunday about um, the Pew study will be discussed, and also the Digital Content Working Group will have a program on Sunday at ALA and also its meetings, which are open to the public. Thank you. So now I would open this up for any questions. Pat, your hand went up first. Uh, Pat Lusinski, Columbus Metropolitan Library. Just want to add a little bit to what Luis mentioned. Um, first off, I want to thank Brewster and DPLA and others because really you have given us a context on which to talk about this and you're way ahead of where public libraries should have been and, and we wouldn't be having this discussion without you. Uh, the issue that we're talking about here related to access is not an or issue either, it's an and. In other words, everything that's going on with DPLA and the rest has to continue um, but downstream, we have people with needs in our public library community who have the device, the broadband, and the credit card to buy commercial digital content. And we have at-risk neighborhoods that don't have that opportunity. And Louise talked about a technology divide or a digital divide. This is now a content divide. So we've had a digital divide for 20 years we've been trying to fight, or a technology divide. Now a, a content divide is being created by publishers. And my point is publishers shouldn't dictate public policy. And we haven't defined how digital materials should be accessed via the copyright laws in this country. So one other quick story. In Ohio, we have talked to former members of Congress about this issue. And when we explained it to them, it was actually the R congressman who said, well, that's a violation of free trade. So I think it's pretty interesting to see where these conversations are going, but what librarians have to hang their hat on is the fact that we represent the public's right to access this material. Not freely, I'm not saying publishers and authors shouldn't be compensated, 
but we've got to stand up for members of the public who don't have access to these materials, and that's uh, one of the strong principles of librarianship we should all stand for. I, I like that idea of a content divide, um, and it, it is frustrating to try to buy books now from publishers, but there's a lot that's under our control and only under our control, and it's the 20th century. It's the things that are never going to be sold from book publishers in EPUB form ever, and it's really up to us, and if we don't get going and do it, then what are we complaining about? So it doesn't cost that much to go and digitize these materials. We now have a 1,000 libraries that have done this. Um, it's been going on for two years. I don't know what, kind of what we're waiting for. And in some, in some of us aren't waiting. But those that are sort of you know, still formulating a strategy, get going. Don't just do a strategy. Is pilot something. Um, start getting going. Start uh, digitizing your 20th century materials and start lending it. It's working. Uh, it's, it's going out to, well, millions now. So at least we can take care of the 20th century as we're uh, still sort of pushing our way into the 21st century for the newest books. Anybody else? Anybody else? Okay, back there. Oh. Oh, sorry. Okay. Yep. Yeah, um, I'm all over the place on this issue. And uh, as a uh, commercial partner, I'm aware maybe I'm a, I'm a skunk at the lawn, lawn party. But uh, I'm also an author. I also work with a nonprofit press, University of California Press. Also work with the San Francisco Public Library. Also work with the Cal Poly State University San Luis Obispo Library. So uh, I am aware that I am skating out on extremely thin ice. Sell us books. By, uh, <laughs> making any kind of statement at all here, but I think the uh, first page on Brewster's uh, PowerPoint was represent a good presentation of the issues. And I think that uh, coming from a family business that's been selling books to libraries for about 200 years, I'm very confident that uh, through uh, creativity and flexibility, and it's uh, the responsibility of publishers to be creative and flexible that we'll arrive at a solution to uh, the issue of ebook pricing, ebook access, and that um, we'll do that because we need each other. We really can't persist in an environment in which um, you know we're fighting each other tooth and nail and taking each other to the court and that kind of thing. So um, you know this is a, a, a great event, and I really appreciate people putting the issue out, and I. Uh, I assure you that I don't know where we are in relation to the big six. We might be at like 7.2 or something like that. But uh, as those of you who know us, and I'm talking about John Wiley and Sons, those of you who, who know us know that we, we do apply creativity and flexibility to working with libraries, and that's what we, continue, we will continue to do in the future. And um, great, great discussion, and I look forward to the solution so we can move on to the next problem. I'm a dialectician at the same time, so I know there'll be a resolution. Thank you. Feel free to be a model you. for your publishing world. Right. You've got millions of dollars to spend, right? Yes. Linda, Linda, if I can, can sort of piggyback on what Peter just mentioned. When he talks about that conversation between, for example, the library community and the publishing community, uh, he walks a talk because one of the things that is in the horizon for us locally is to have a conversation about the future of publishing and what it means from the, the library side and the publishing side. So we're gonna bring our management teams together to have that conversation, which I think is one of those next steps, if you will, in terms of having open dialogue. As I said, Peter, you'd make a wonderful poster boy for this. Um, anybody else have something that they wanna say? I've got a mic. Oh. Oh. Um, I just have a question. Um, have any of you on the panel thought about what does this DPLA movement mean for the communities that are served by public libraries? What's, what's the potential or the threat, if there is one, in the DPLA 
movement for the publics that many public libraries serve? So, so for me, I, I think that there's tremendous opportunity. Um, putting aside any uh, you know, discussion about access to commercial content or um, uh, externally published content, I think that the DPLA movement, from what I've been hearing since I've been here, is this opportunity to really create this movement around local content. So it isn't just the stagnant piece of digitizing things that already exist, yearbooks or old newspapers, but it's um, about things that I heard when I was in Scandinavia, where communities are coming together to create new content, um, and people contribute to that, and it's a very active, and um, it, you know, it's kind of a self-perpetuating process. And I think that's something that is really desired and craved in our communities across America. There's a role for public libraries to take leadership. Um, we probably need templates and models and leaders in the field, and um, you know, somebody is going to need to do that. And I'll respond to that. Uh, to me, it's a couple of concepts. One is the scalability of having local materials um, accessible in a much, much broader um, arena, from local to global, as I said earlier this morning. Uh, the other one is about capacity building. I mean, there is an opportunity there um, with some of the, just a diversity of different types of library institutions to be able to uh, get some support down the road in terms of not only resource sharing, but um, how to do it, how to, be able to manage these collections and prioritize collections, but it's about sharing. It's not gonna fall on the DPLA model, but it's um, an area where you can point to some capacity building. And also it will um, have add the quality, that it will be, have some kind of a standard quality so that it will all be regulated to, to, be this, to look right, to have the right feel for it. I'd say a downside on, on a DPLA, you know, sort of how bad could it get, would be building centralized points of control. And I think on the upside would be a, uh, a movement through DPLA and others to make every library in America be a digital library. That's, I think, our goal. Can I just say something? Because also, if there isn't kind of a, a, a grassroots movement that helps us to connect, I, I see that you know, it'll be a commercial movement that helps us to connect. And again, we'll, we'll be in the, bond, in the bind where the platform control is not in the hands of the libraries and the local communities. Um, I was just wondering, um, Sari, have you spoke, I mean, Random House has implied that they are looking at a more ownership model of libraries when they buy ebooks. Um, where is that conversation going, and are other publishers um, following, being at least contemplating this idea? Um, the publishers continue to meet with the ALA leadership. We actually take that as a very encouraging sign that even though um, you know, they, they hear the discontent, they know it's out there, that they're very open to, to establishing an improved relationship. And so they're all exploring the possibility of different models. And you know, um, we have to take our lead from the publishers to release any information. It's oh. not really for ALA to do. And then Brewster, have you thought about buying Random House books? <laughs> we have tried, 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 throwed $100 bills at these guys. Um, Peter, uh, do, do you want to speak of, of your recent discussions with the executives at Random? Peter Brantley works for the Internet Archive. One of his jobs is to buy ebooks. And um, how's it going, Peter? It's not been a lot of fun, Brewster. Thanks for that. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, I am in conversation with Random House, and so we'll see how those conversations go. So the answer is so far is no. I mean, there, there's this concept of, of buying, you know, people say, oh, we'll sell it to you. That means we'll take your money. But it doesn't mean. That we're buying it in any sense like we used to buy things. It's sort of like um, when everybody's open, but 
you have to be a little more, you have to ask the next question of what does open mean to you? Um, and so we haven't gotten to the point where we're buying uh, and so that we can lend, that we can preserve materials. I think this is uh, very, uh, very important. But if there are other publishers in the world, there, there's millions of dollars sitting on this, these stools right now looking to spend millions of dollars to buy ebooks. We're having a hard time with it. So right now we're doing, mostly we're doing scanning. I, I really think that some of the publishers, the big six, are, are inching toward this. Um, I, we are working in Khalifa on a, an Adobe content server similar to the Douglas County one, only this will be a statewide for California. And we've had a call this week from a, one of the big six publishers, and so has the Douglas County Library. So they're at least checking us out, they're feeling us out to see how much of, you know, can, how big is this and what's it going to look like. Um, so there are some feelers out, and I know Brewster has been in contact with, and Peter has talked to some of them, and we're working on it. Everybody's working on it. Anybody else? Um, so I'm curious with the ebook lending model that that you have going to Internet Archive is um, so if someone checks out HTML5 for designers. It's checked out. There's only one copy in circulation at a time. That's as many as we've bought. Um, wow. And and then so, uh, well, when we scan, we only have one copy. So we're, right now we're doing one copy. We'd like to, for at least the old stuff, expand it maybe in orphans and things like this. But right now it's basically one copy, one patron. Uh, and then we're trying to buy as many copies of books as we can, as we've said. So I guess the follow-up would be, as you. Once it's been scanned once, uh, you could lend it more and more times as you collect physical copies as well? Right now, what we're doing is we're, we have one copy. We're, we're scanning it, putting it out, and just making sure all of that seems to work and uh, make steps forward. I, I think the real goal here is to, at least for the things that are commercially viable, to put money in the pockets of publishers and authors. That's our goal, um, and we'll scan what we have to. Um, and there's an awful lot of the 20th century to do. So it's not like there's, there's a shortage of things to do, but uh, we want a complete picture. We have a question from the internet. Um, Oliverius asks, what will it take for publishers to nix DRM? What will it take for publishers to nix DRM? Yes. Um, wanting to have a business at the end of the day. Um, uh, it, there's. Uh, there are different industries that have tried DRM. They either don't last long. The software in the 1980s started to have DRM. And I remember talking to Mitch Kapor, who started Lotus. And I said, why did you take D uh, DRM off of, off of Lotus, uh, the, the first spreadsheet? And he said, because people couldn't figure it out. They didn't want it. And we wanted to make money. Duh. Um, the, the, uh, the, the music guys also it took them quite a while uh, of sort of thinking that Apple was going to be their, their savior before they realized that they really had to get selling things themselves through multiple channels. And I think that the, uh, I'm hoping that the, the book publishers move through this fairly quickly, this period fairly quickly, and start selling um, books in a fairly straightforward way through a bunch of channels so that there are lots of booksellers uh, and there are lots of publishers at the end of the day. And there are lots of distributors and no central points of control. I think that the, the DRM um, uh, idea has often been sort of held out and has caused uh, business troubles for lots of organizations. Um, sorry. Uh, so the, the DRM issue with publishers is actually rapidly evolving. Uh, we've just exited out of the London Book Fair, and there have been discussions there, and a lot of discussions uh, before that meeting, and, and certainly ongoing now about um, some of the big publishers beginning to move toward dropping DRM for markets uh, that involve EPUB, which is the open standard for books. Um, so the first of those that's happened outside of O'Reilly, of course, and a few other extant examples include Bain Books and um, a few others. But the, the first notable one recently uh, is a publisher 
called Doherty, which tour books, science fiction imprints, um, just announced that they were dropping DRM um, starting in uh, summer of this year. What's notable about that? What's notable about that is that uh, Tor is an imprint of Macmillan, uh, which is one of the big six publishers. So this is widely seen as an interesting experiment uh, within one of the big six uh, to drop DRM. Now, of course, uh, Amazon uses its own proprietary format and, um, and it continues to use content protection measures for that. But for other platforms, uh, in part as a purpose Purposeful, uh, yeah, sorry, too late in the afternoon. Purposeful competitive positioning. Uh, large publishers are beginning to look at dropping uh, DRM. That doesn't mean that that will happen quickly, um, and it probably will take some time to evolve. But this is not something that we should necessarily assume won't happen. It's hard to scan the truth. <laughs> There were two really interesting comments made earlier today. One was that uh, a large proportion of the most popular books on Amazon sold in any given day were self-published. And another was Tim's comment reminding everyone that a lot of the material we should think about archiving and curating is the ephemeral thing, ephemeral material that aren't books, but that make up most of what we read and publish and share online. Um, what can the DPLA and what can libraries in the room do to help uh, improve lending and sharing of those materials? I'll just say, because I don't want to take it away from him, but Nate Hill and I were on a panel together um, earlier this year, and he gave, Nate, raise your hand so people remember who you are. Um, and uh, he gave this great talk about self-publishing and the way libraries could play a role by creating a space in the catalog for people who were writing and intending to publish their work to start being in our library catalogs as a discovery tool. And it was extremely provocative to me. And um, so that's somebody who you might want to hear from later on. That was just a great idea. Nate, would you want to say something about that? Uh, I guess the basic idea is that if you were to come to the San Francisco Public Library and come to a, a web interface where you were presented with the option of make a project. And that project might be an ebook of some kind or another. Uh, and you log in and you start to write your book about where the best Mexican food is in San Francisco. And um, as you're writing this book about the best Mexican food in San Francisco, a record of a certain item type is automatically generated in the catalog. So when somebody's searching for Mexican cooking or something like that, then if they want to filter down and have sort of that local level of content displayed there in their results, they can get that as well. At the same time that they're looking at all sort of these uh, localized pieces of content, they have the ability to kind of vote them up or down in case Nate Hill doesn't know anything about Mexican food in San Francisco. The community can start to say, you know, this is sort of a useless project and it's going to go down in the search results. Um, it could even go as far as being something where <clears throat> if uh, the library wanted sort of a, a, a print version of this thing, people could actually pledge money toward this thing being printed, right? And everybody could contribute like it's some kind of Kickstarter. And uh, this book becomes, you know, the ultimate Mexican food guide in San Francisco. I don't know about that, but yeah. Uh, Stephen Abram at Cengage Learning. I just want to put some context into the free books on Amazon. Some of the analysis that's been done of it is most of the growth was provided by a very small number of companies, less than a dozen, who were using it as a content spam opportunity to flood uh, eBooks into Amazon and load them with search engine optimization to drive ads and certain other features. So we've got to keep our librarian hats on around the quality of the content that's being loaded up into some of these archives, which are driven by direct media and the large content spam companies, which is a multi, multi-billion dollar industry right now. When you're making, when Google makes $30 billion every, in profit every three months, it's driven by 
op activities like that. So we can't just accept content without keeping our filters on around branding and quality and uh, authorship and authority. I but if that was true, Reddit wouldn't work, right? I mean, the community can police content and decide that it's relevant and push it to the top. Yeah. The community can police content. Librarians have been doing it for years. Yeah. I think we're out of time, so you guys can settle that <laughs> offline. Um, <laughs> But you did say what I was trying to say not well, that the DPL can provide for local uh, digitization and so forth, a quality um, that we can all adhere to and, and help you do those kinds of things. I don't know how I got to that. Anyways, you're out of time. If you guys want to discuss this offline, feel free. Thank you. Thanks.